So I thought we're delighted to have him here. Uh, he is, uh, Thank you in, for inviting me. <laughs> he's one of the greatest persons, in my opinion, that are currently working in Vision. And uh, he has this fantastic idea of actionable information that I think fits exactly on our concept of how do we put dynamical systems together with sensors. So without further ado, I'll, I'll just leave it to him. Thank you very much. Very generous of you. So let me, before I start, let me say what an honor it is to be here and to follow Rujina because she has been really one of the pioneers of pretty much all the ideas that I will talk about today. So she mentioned, <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Uh, so um, you mentioned to Gibson. We should make this the theme of the workshop, modest. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I agree. <laughs> I heard it was in short supply in the conference. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I put a title, uh, Controlled Sensing, uh, sort of as a pun uh, of compressed sensing, because uh, uh, a lot of effort has been put uh, in the past few years on how to gather as little data as possible, which is a real problem in some applications, for instance, MRI and so on. But, uh, in the domain where I work, typically uh, the data is everywhere and there's no shortage of it. Uh, you can, with your phone, you can capture uh, uh, megabits per second of data. And the goal is not how to capture as little data as possible, but how to get as much information as possible from the data that is gathered. And it turns out that that is a control problem. So often people ask, you know, uh, what kind of sensing do I need for action or interaction or control, since interaction is the theme. But I'm more asking the question as what kind of control do I need to sense the things I need to sense? And so, but you could replace the name control sensing with active vision, and it would be a very appropriate name. And as Rujina mentioned, these are not new ideas. They date back uh, decades. And if Gibson was the one that first expressed these ideas in words, I see Rujina as the first one that instantiated uh, this in physical embodiments and in experiments and, and in an engineering context. And I would like to play a small role in trying to take these same ideas and trying to formalize them and see if we can do some analysis on that. Okay. Uh, so the context in which I'm operating is uh, in vision, not because that's what I do, but I do this because I think that vision intended broadly as passive, remote, non-contact sensing that is subject to occlusions and scaling. This plays a critical role for three reasons. Number one, then in passive remote non-contact sensing, almost all the complexity of the data can be explained with nuisance factor, stuff you really don't care about, okay? So this makes it different than the type of sensing you're used to in control systems where you measure a few voltages, a few, a few capacities and other things or currents. Really, most of the volume of the data is due to stuff you're not interested in. The second issue is that scaling makes the continuous limit relevant in the analysis, okay? So as you get closer to objects, more and more details are being revealed and this process never stops. Or the other way around, as you move farther away, something is all, you never have enough resolution. And so this is very different from, let's say, communications, where you have a finite granularity, finite complexity that comes from the source, and you can discretize the universe at the outset. You cannot do that in this type of remote sensing. And finally, occlusions is what makes control critical, because unless you are able to exercise control over the sensing process, you cannot close the information gap. Okay, so scaling and occlusion play a critical role, and, and, and I believe that if you don't understand these, you don't understand this. So, let me open a parenthesis and kind of tell you a little bit, uh, you know, maybe in a cartoonish uh, fashion, but the type of signal models you have to deal with if you want to operate in this space. So, you know, we're all used to, and we teach, uh, you know, linear models or signal plus noise models where perhaps the object of interest, which I will call Xi here, okay, uh, is related to your measurement by some additive perturbation and your object of interest lives in a finite dimensional vector space and uh, you know everything. Perhaps you even have some priors on the uncertainty and some prior on the object of interest. And if you're fancy, maybe these object of interest are functions, so they live in some type of Hilbert space or some type of uh, uh, LP space. Uh, 
and maybe you have also some operators, but, and, and maybe these, these are functions themselves. But in all of these models, the only uncertainty you have is additive. Okay, so that affords some type of simplifications that uh, have been carrying us in engineering, especially in controls, communication, signal processing, for quite a long time. But in vision, uh, what happens is that because you don't choose the excitatory signal, you don't choose the illumination, you have functions acting on your unknowns, and these functions are uh, unknown themselves. Okay, so you wouldn't call them noise, okay, they don't have the statistical properties of noise, but they are things you don't know and you don't necessarily care about. If you give me a task, let's say recognizing or locating Rujina, I want to be able to do so regardless of whether it's I'm indoor, outdoor, sunny, shiny, uh, cloudy, whatever. So you will have unknown transformations of the range, space of your data. And also because of viewpoint changes, you have unknown transformations of the domain of the data. So if I want to recognize Rujina, I want to be able to do so regardless of where she is, okay? So not only that, but depending on your task, what you're interested in only occupies a possibly small subset of the data domain. So really, you're interested only in a piece of your data. So there's a characteristic function that says what you're interested in is only here, and elsewhere, there is something else that you don't know. Okay? So this is the simplest signal model that I know of that has all the ingredients I need. It has scaling, has occlusions, okay? it has viewpoint, illumination, and so on and so forth. Okay? And so you measure Y, your data, your images, and you're interested in C, some property of your scene could be geometric, photometric, dynamic, semantic properties of the scene. You don't know the illumination, you don't know the viewpoint, you don't know the occlusion, you don't know the occluder, and then everything else that you have not modeled gets lumped into an additive residual that you can call noise. Okay? So it's somewhat unfortunate that these models are a bit more complicated than what we're used to, but this is the simplest I know of. Okay? So just to put a little bit of order, let me name some of these quantities, and just this is entirely formal, so I will not uh, get into the details of instantiating what these are, but there are nuisances, so things you don't know and you don't care about, but that affect your data, that have the structure of a group. Okay, it could be finite or infinite dimensional, it doesn't matter, but ha are groups. So in particular, you can invert them. There are things that are additive, and uh, you know, they have some simple statistical description, maybe wide zero mean Gaussian or some other uh, simple uh, uh, distributional properties. And then there's everything else that uh, is neither a group nor additive, and these are the difficult ones to deal with. So when I write the data formation process, uh, formally I write that the data is a function H of the scene, which is what you're interested in, and the nuisance, Ni, and I separate the group component of the nuisance and the additive component of the nuisance, okay? So here's a couple of examples. This is a scene, my office, uh, viewed from a certain vantage point with certain illumination, certain occlusion, and so on. This is the same scene, different illumination, same vantage point. Same scene, different vantage point, different illumination. Same scene, same vantage point, different occlusions. And this is an entirely different scene, OK? So C should remind you scene and new is nuisances and then G is the group component, and N is the noise, okay? So let me, uh, Rujina had all of these nice uh, uh, flow charts. So let me try to uh, illustrate my own flow chart of how I see this uh, type of uh, sensory processing happening. So here's the world that has the scene. I haven't really told you what a scene is, and I will never be able to tell you what the scene is. I've spoken with philosophers. They say the scene does not exist, okay? So if your calculation at any point involves you doing something with C, it's not gonna work. Okay, the scene exists out there, you don't know what it is, but what you know is that you have a certain task, and depending on the task, there are some aspects of the scene that matter, and some that don't. The one that don't, you call them nuisances. This depends on the task, okay? If I want to recognize something, illumination is a nuisance, viewpoint is a nuisance. If I want to drive my car, viewpoint is not a nuisance, it's very important because you want to know where you are, okay? Now, the scene, you think of it as a functional, 
And you have probing functions, which are called sensors, that give you data. Now, this data is well-defined, lives in finite dimensional uh, spaces, uh, has finite <laughs> complexity, and so on and so forth. And you could have different types of sensors, uh, optical, infrared, multispectral, uh, inertial, laser, and so on and so forth. Okay? So the world generates images. And this is your only window into the scene. That's all you know about it. Okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> depending on your task, there might be some nuisances that you can get rid of in pre-processing without a loss. In particular, when you have groups, there is a constructive process for doing that, which is called canonization. And so what you're left with is not the raw data, but the maximal invariant, which is a function of the data. Okay? Because you have a model of the nuisance, okay, if you had a model of the scene, you could also generate not the data, but the maximal invariant of the data. And the discrepancy, I don't want to say the difference between the two, is your information increment, or think of it as your innovation process. And so you have the sensing loop is essentially charge of building a representation. What is a representation? A representation is a function of data. Okay, so it's a function of Y. And I give it the name C that sort of is reminiscent of the scene, but C hat, because not because I can directly compare it with a, C, with a scene, but because I can compare the image, the data that the scene generates with the data that the representation hallucinates. Okay? If the two are indistinguishable, then I say this is as well as I can do. Okay? Of course, the scene lives in a completely different space. And I cannot compare directly a representation with a scene, but I can compare the data that comes from one and the data that's hallucinated by the other. So this is the sensing loop. And there is a criterion for inference here that I will explain in detail uh, in the next slide. But here's the problem that this representation is a function of the data. And if I want, and, and intuitively, if you do system identification, for instance, you know that you believe your model is good if you can uh, have small uh, prediction error or uninformative uh, prediction residual. So you want to make the innovation uninformative. So you would like to be able to say that your representation uh, generates predictions with very little uncertainty. So you would like to minimize uh, some type of prediction error quantity. But this, if you, if you work in identification, for this to be, uh, to, to be viable, your input has to be sufficiently exciting. And so unless you, as a species, have control over the data acquisition process, you will be never be able to guarantee that this is satisfied. Okay? So somebody gives you data, you cannot test for sufficient excitation. But if you can acquire the data you want, then you can. So there is a loop that goes in the other direction that controls the data acquisition process so as to generate data which is as uninformative as possible. Okay? So the criterion for control here, you will notice, is exactly the same one as the criterion for inference, only that in one case you minimize it with respect to the representation, in the other case you maximize it with respect to the control. So I will derive this criterion in the next slide. But the idea here is that there is a sensing loop that operates here, and there is a control loop that operates in the opposite direction, and they're trying to do the same thing. One is maximizing it, one is minimizing it. So the inference is trying to find the representation that explains future data as well as possible. And the control is trying to generate new measurements that are as unpredictable as possible given the current representation. Okay? So intuitively that makes sense, but I'd like to derive it. So this quantity here, which is the object of inference that depends on the control, is literally the information bottleneck, for those of you that are familiar with that. I'll show it in a second. And the quantity that sits here, which is the information increment, is the innovation of your process, the one you use to update your representation. OK? So let me spend one slide on the inference part, and then I'd like to say a couple of things about the control part. If you have questions, if I say something that doesn't make sense to you, please interrupt me any time. The beauty of this workshop is that uh, you know, it's a cozy venue. So yes. I do have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, on, on your previous slide, which I find fascinating, <laughs> so you're saying, well, the representation is basically the information bottleneck. And I, I've always had this idea in my head, and I basically wanted to know what is your opinion about this. I've always said, well, if you want to understand, for example, occlusions, mm -hmm. what you should do is that your representation should be a computer graphic version of the room you're looking at. For example, I put a camera on a robot, and I want the robot to map this room. Mm -hmm. And since there are occlusions, the robot cannot map the room. Right. So 
Should I, should I actually be representing this using computer graphics and getting a representation that has, I don't know, gigabytes of data on it? Mm -hmm. So uh, I hope I will answer your question uh, by the end of it, but let me just give you the, so first of all, in computer graphics, you generate every pixel in the image. Now, depending on, your representation depends on the task. Okay, so if your task is to drive your vehicle, you don't care that the color of the wall is that particular shade of beige. So you don't really want to generate this, something that you can compare with images at the pixel level, right? So there is a level of abstraction that goes from the data to some type of intermediate representation that excludes or factors out or discounts portion of the data formation process that you know you don't care about. Okay, for instance, for navigation, reflectance properties of surfaces are irrelevant. You don't want to bump into a wall, whether it's blue or black or gray, right? Uh, but, you know, if your goal is rendering, so to generate models that you can view from a different vantage point, then you have to generate every pixel, right? So the, the answer to that depends on the representation. Uh, so, the, sorry, the, the answer to that depends on the task, okay? Now, if somebody comes to me and says, well, you know, humans solve all possible tasks in the world. So if I want to solve all possible tasks in the world, what should my representation be? Well, then I don't know. Then it may be right that I have to be able to generate every pixel. So I don't know. Okay, so let me derive the criterion first. So uh, the data, I call them Y, and Y up to T to me means the history up to time T as conventional in information and in, uh, identification. And just a reminder that uh, if you want to say something about the scene, Given the data, there is a quantity, which is the mutual information between the scene and the data that fits naturally there. And just as a reminder that if you process the data with any deterministic or stochastic function, in general, you can only do worse. So this is the data processing inequality that says that you cannot create information by torturing the data. So if the amount of information that the data contains about the scene is greater than or equal to the amount that any function of the data contains about the scene. Since I work in vision, I would have to ask myself the question of what are we doing? Because in vision, we are doing nothing else but torturing the data. We do edge detection, feature selection, segmentation, stuff that in principle does no good to us, can only do worse, okay? So one of my mentors, Don Snyder, used to say that his mother always told him to never throw away information. And to him, computer vision didn't make any sense because all we're doing is throwing away information. And uh, now, if you have a specific task, uh, and associated to it, you have a loss, and associated to the loss, you have a risk. Still, the information, uh, the data processing inequality applies in the sense that if the risk given the raw data is always less than or equal than the risk given any function of the data, and if you are familiar with the recent resurgence of deep learning, uh, they operate in this space, which is theoretically sound in the sense that, well, here's a big black box. This is my task, this is my data. I want to train this big machine that does the best thing possible given the data for the particular task. Okay, so, but to go back to Don Snyder's objection is that the processing inequality has le less than or equal here. So if you can find a function of the data that gives you the equal sign, right, then you don't throw away anything and this is what's called a sufficient statistic. Yes, Regina. I, I actually will take issue with the PR <laughs> We are, we are throwing away the data temporarily because actually the world is out there. Mm -hmm. If you yes. accept Gibson uh, hypothesis, the world is out there and we have the mechanism to reacquire. Yes, re yes, re absolutely. So therefore, we are operating under the assumption that the, the world is out there and we are only taking at that moment Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Yes, and I will come back to that. So that's when the control comes in. So in this slide, I'm just deriving the inference criterion, meaning for the data that comes in, how should, what is the criterion that you should use in order to infer the best possible function of the data, okay? And so the idea is that here is that you may be able to throw away lots of data and yet none of the information. Meaning that if your function leaves the equal sign in the data processing inequality, then you have not thrown away any information, okay? But you may be able to throw away lots of the data. So 
there are many different notions of sufficient statistics. They are all sort of more or less equivalent to this. But unfortunately, these sufficient statistics typically do not exist. Uh, finite dimensional sufficient statistics uh, with uh, a constant domain of the distribution only exist for the exponential family. Uh, Koopman, Pitman, your theorem. So uh, what you can do is you can relax this notion and instead of trying to make this equal to this, try to make the difference as small as possible. Perhaps subject to some complexity constraint. So this object here has to decide in your memory. So it has finite, it has to have finite complexity. Okay. And so if you play with the properties of mutual information, this is equivalent to this. And this is called the information bottleneck. Okay. So this is saying that your representation is the bottleneck between the data and what you want. And it's the one that minimizes the mutual information between the data and the representation, and at the same time maximizes the mutual information between the representation and the task. Okay? So this is a sensible criterion. Unfortunately, it depends on the scene, which is an object that I don't even know how to describe, let alone putting a metric structure on it, putting a probabilistic structure on it, and so on and so forth. So again, if you play with properties of mutual information, you can show that this problem is equivalent to this problem in the sense that the minimizers are the same. There's a lot of subtleties that I'm sweeping under the rug here, but essentially what this boils down to is that the minimizer C hat is the same that minimizes the conditional entropy of future measurements from the current type up to infinity, uh, subject to a complexity constraint but not really the complexity of the raw data, the pixel values, but the complexity of the part of the data that matters to your task, okay? So this is the, what I call the actionable information. So this is the type of thing that you're trying to make small. So trying to find a representation that allows you to predict the future or the, the part of the future data that matters to you, subject to complexity constraints, okay? And this really, if you think about it in filtering terms, should be the state in the sense that it's a function of the past that is best for predicting the future or at least the portion of the future that matters given complexity constraints or given available resources. So it's really a, a natural extension of the concept of state that we are used to in standard systems theory, right? So in linear systems, you have these Markov treating subspaces uh, we don't have a separation principles here, but this is as close as we can get to it. Okay? So that's really this piece of the picture. Okay? Okay? So before I get to Ruzina's objection, which is, well, really, the information is, is always there. It's just a matter of going and getting it, okay, which requires a deliberate control action. Let me say a couple of words of why the inference part is non-trivial, okay? So I've been going around for a few years saying that, you know, vision is difficult not because of the complexity of the things we're interested in, okay? Uh, for instance, we're interested in humans. Humans come in different size, you know, size, shape, color, pose, and so on and so forth. Vision is difficult because of the infinite variability of all the things we are not interested in, okay? And in fact, this type of variability swamps completely the intra-class variability, the variability of the things we're interested in, okay? So, you know, you want to detect, recognize an apple, there's apples of different colors, types, type, shape, but if you pick even one apple and look at all the images that that apple can generate on the different viewpoint, illumination, partial occlusions, that spans an open set in the set of images. So you can generate anything you want from it. So recently, this idea has been kind of going around. This is a statement in uh, Tommy Podge's tech report from last year, it says, my conjecture is that, so of course I don't claim anything about biological vision, I, have, I don't know anything about it, but Tommy Pojo claims something like that, he says that he believes that the goal of the ventral stream is to factor out nuisances, essential, and that invariance for transformation is the main reason for the hierarchy and for the areas of cortical patches that are needed, okay? So I don't know if that's true or not, it's, it's an interesting conjecture, this is a picture of a macaque monkey brain, not very different from ours. 
that shows you that if this is your cortex, it's about the size of your two hands, about half of it processes visual information. Okay, so that's no proof of the fact that it's difficult, but it's kind of indicative of that. So in other words, it's really all about the nuisances. So the effort you need to make in order to get rid of stuff you're not interested in is much bigger than the effort you need in order to represent the stuff you are interested in. And here's an, uh, an experiment Tommy Poggio did. If you pick any state-of-the-art visual recognition system and you try to recognize dogs from horses, you get chance performance, 50%, okay? But if you put the dogs and the horses in canonical configuration, same vantage point, same distance, no occlusions, then it's trivial. In fact, with uh, five samples, you get uh, essentially human performance with a nearest neighbor classifier. So in, a, in other words, the problem is trivial. So the difficulty is not the fact that there are different dogs of different color, different kinds, different shapes. The problem is that both dogs and horses can appear in different position, orientation, scale, partial occlusions, illumination, and so on. Once you get rid of that, problem is trivial. Okay, so this is about biology, a statement about biology. I don't know anything about that, but what I did write back in 2009 is that visual recognition is difficult because of the variabilities that images of a particular object, just pick one, exhibit depending on in extrinsic factors such as vantage point, illumination, occlusion, and so on and so forth. And you can in fact state that in a theorem in the sense that you can show that the volume of the residual of data space after you quotient out viewpoint and illumination, even a simple point, is a zero measure set. So the volume is zero. Okay? Okay, so now let me go back to the control. So even if you're able to factor out uh, the nuisances, you get not the complexity of the data, but the complexity of the maximal invariant of the data. You still may have no information whatsoever because what you really want is the complexity of a complete representation. A complete representation is a function of the data that allows you to hallucinate or to synthesize any future data in the, f in, in the future, right? So for instance, a, so a complete representation of this room might be all possible images of this room that I can take from all possible vantage point at all possible resolutions at all possible times, okay? So if I had a minimal sufficient statistic of that, I could answer any question I wanted about the scene. In general, these are different, and the difference is this gap. And the problem is that this in order for you to reduce this gap, you need to exercise control over the sensing space. If I'm standing here and I'm looking for my phone and my phone is behind the table, I could have a million images. If I don't see the phone, I don't see the phone. There's nothing I can say about its location or its identity and so on, okay? Okay, so what is the criterion that you should uh, exercise uh, in order to close the information gap? Well, it's the same inference criterion, only that in order to maximize the information increment, you want to maximize the uncertainty of future measurements. In this case, it's that's the next measurement, so just one step. Okay? And of course, you should maximize it with respect to whatever control action you have available to uh, influence the data acquisition process. Okay? Now, this question, th this quantity is, once you condition enough, it's not all that difficult to compute, but even if you could compute that, optimizing this quantity is a very difficult problem because it amounts to a hamilton jacobi bellman uh, PDE or a generic pond DP, if you think of it as discrete, in a space that's infinite dimensional itself. So it's an infinite dimensional optimal control problem. Okay? But, but yes. When you say that you want to optimize on your future. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before you get the images, right. <laughs> that makes a lot of assumptions. Oh, yes. Yes. And the assumptions are encapsulated in your representation. So based on your representation, you can hallucinate future images, not just values, but distributions of them. And the volume of the distribution, the entropy of the distribution is what you're trying to make as large as possible by acting on your control. This is sort of like the 20 question games, right? In the 20 question games, the universe is finite, very large, but finite. You have your control action is the question you ask, and you want to ask the question that will make your future answer as uncertain as possible. 50-50 chance, ideally, right? Because if you ask me a question that I know the answer already, I don't get any information from it. 
So this is the same except that the universe of possible answers is a set of all possible control action, which is much bigger than that. So you're assuming that in your representation you have enough information to predict. To ask the questions, yes. Yes. So now, as I said, scale and occlusions play a crucial role. Okay? There are many other sources of uncertainty, but certainly what is behind this wall, I have no idea. I could guess, I could guess that there is another lecture room, and so I can make a prediction, right? But maybe there is a bar, right? So certainly there's a lot of uncertainty which is due to occlusion. And there's also uncertainty which is due to scale because my phone could always be, could be in front of my nose but far enough away that I cannot see it, okay? So first I want to say a couple of words about how you detect occlusions because if I'm standing here, I cannot tell whether something is occluded. You know, it could be that you are all three-dimensional objects standing in front of each other and occluding each other or it could be that you are a picture just all glued onto the same plane and there's no occlusion, right? So first I want to detect occlusions. I will spend a couple of uh, uh, slides about that. Then I want to say something about how to minimize uncertainty due to occlusions. So this will be visibility-based optimal path planning. And then I want to say something about minimizing uncertainty due to occlusion and scaling. And this will be a simulation. And I'll talk about uh, porcini mushroom harvesting, if that interests you. <laughs> OK. Uh, how much, uh, so I'm counted 28 minutes so far. How much time do I have? 20. I have 20 more minutes, okay, very good. Okay, so I don't wanna spend much on occlusion detection. I just wanna tell you uh, a couple of things that occlusion detection arises uh, as an hypothesis testing problem when you're trying to explain the next image at the next time using the previous image at the current time by deforming the previous image. And where there is co-visibility, you will be able to explain the next image using the previous one up to a small residual or an uninformative residual, okay? But this is true all over the image domain except where uh, it's occluded. And where it's occluded, anything can happen, okay? So if you want to detect occlusion, this naturally lends itself to a mix L0 L1 optimization problem where the residual, the prediction residual is either small but defined everywhere, or it could be large but it's sparse because as you move from t to t plus one, the area that becomes unoccluded is arbitrarily small as a function of dt, okay? So as dt becomes small, this becomes small, can never go to zero, but becomes small, okay? So you can frame this problem in a reweighted L1 fashion, it becomes convex, you globally optimize it, and there are efficient techniques for doing that, augmented Lagrangian scheme, and split Bragman, and so on, okay? So this is a problem that I consider, uh, I don't want to say solved, but fairly, we have fairly good tools for it, okay? Uh, now, as, suppose that you have detected occlusions. Now, when I talk about objects, so I haven't used the word object so far, I believe. And the reason I haven't is because lots of people, there are lots of paper on object detection, object recognition. Nobody says what an object is. There's no definition of object. So here's my definition of object. Going back to Gibson, uh, as Regina mentioned, uh, Gibson defines objects as what he calls detached objects as layouts of surfaces. So these exist in the scene uh, that are completely surrounded by the medium. And this is important because it means that you can grab them, okay? Very good. So first of all, objects exist in the scene, not in the image. When people say, well, you know, how many objects that are on the image? Zero. There's no people in images. There's no cars in images, nor building. These exist in the scene, and you want to infer that from images. But if you look around, how many detached objects do you see? I don't see any, right? I, let's see. Now I see one, but, you know, most objects are not detached in the sense that they're not completely surrounded by the medium, but they are partially surrounded by the medium in the sense that uh, you can put a ring around an object, right? Uh, for instance, you know, the, uh, the chandelier or people that are standing or cups and so on and so forth. So they are partially surrounded by the medium. And the important thing about being partially surrounded by the medium is the fact that 
if you're partially surrounded by the amino, as soon as you move or I move, that induces occlusions, okay? And so I call detachable objects, objects that are partially surrounded by the medium. Now, many people don't like this definition, and I agree the name is a misnomer, uh, because things like trees and cars satisfy this definition, but in fact, they are detachable, as you can see. So, you know, you can detach trees and houses and so on and so forth. Uh, so I don't have a better name for it, so I'll stick to it. But I'll argue that this is not a detachable object, and we'll see it in a second. So why are why is this uh, notion important? As I said, the moment you have a detachable object, as soon as it moves or you move, that generates occlusion. So when you have occlusions, I know that there is a portion of the scene that is in front of another portion of the scene. And I know it everywhere there is an occlusion. Of course, I have no idea whether this is in front of this. I only have local partial ordering relations. But it turns out that given these local partial ordering relations, bootstrapping them into a global order is trivial because it's a linear program, okay? So if you define a function that is integer valued uh, that at every pixel associate a number, and that number uh, determines occlusion relations, so this object is in front of this object and so on and so forth, you can minimize the class discrepancy against the data de dependent measure that tells you that these, occlusion that these ordinary relations are violated at occlusions because, of course, the solution to this is a constant everywhere, but if you impose the fact that at occlusion, one point has to be strictly in front of another point, for instance, the red has to be strictly behind the yellow, then you get a global ordering relation, and this is a problem that you can solve with linear programming, okay? So the result of this is a simply connected partition of images into regions that correspond to detachable objects, to objects that are partially surrounded by the medium. So that's my definition. And you can do, by the way, also uh, model selection with this. If you don't know how many objects there are, there's a, an infinity norm of that, that the number of objects is a complexity constraint, and you can solve all of this with linear programming, okay? So here's some examples uh, of things where it works, things where it doesn't. Uh, let me skip this and just show you this example, which is a case where if you are trying to detect people from one image, you would detect a girl uh, crossing the street, but in fact, it's not a detachable object. It's painted on the ground. And so if you run a detachable object detector, it will find the car, but not the girl, which is what we want, okay? <coughs> okay, so let me now talk about control. So now the scenario is the following. You have the ability to move. You have the ability to detect occlusions. You have the ability to separate the touchable object, okay? Now the question is, how do you generate control actions that will maximize the information content of future measurements, okay? I will do two cases. First, the case where the only uncertainty is due to occlusions, okay? Meaning that the only reason I don't see an object is because it's not visible, but the moment it becomes visible, even if it's infinitely far away, I detect it, okay? So the scenario is the one where you enter a room, you're looking for your phone, you look around. The moment you have line of sight, you can determine that it's there, but unless you see it, you cannot. Okay. The only uncertainty is due to visibility, okay? So as I said, the continuous limit is relevant here. So uh, of course, coming from UCLA, you cannot get away uh, with uh, not using level sets for something. So uh, here I represent obstacles or objects uh, as simply connected uh, portion of the scene. These are detachable objects, which you can represent with one function. Okay, so they're the zero level set of one function in one dimension uh, bigger. And so uh, this function psi, which could be a sign distance function, is positive uh, in the transversal space, is negative inside, and it's zero on the surface of your detachable object. And so then there is a function little phi, which is the minimizer of C, that tells you whether a point Y is visible from point X. So if you are at the point X and you are considering going to a point Y, if this function is positive, you can go there, otherwise you can't. And so the visible region is the positive sublevel sets of that. This function phi satisfy a simple PDE, so you can actually compute it efficiently and if you know the environment. 
And you can also compute it efficiently along a path. So if you give me a path, uh, what is the picture? If you give me a path, I can solve this PDE efficiently and determine all the points that are visible. I'm showing this for the unit square, okay, which is a cartoon, cartoonish model, but conceptually you can uh, extend it. Now, one thing to notice is that this is a PDE, but it's a kind of a weird PDE. It's actually an ODE because capital phi, which is the cumulative visibility function, does not appear in the derivative form in this side. It's only a constraint on the fact that little phi has to be equal to big phi in the visible region. So it's actually an ODE, but it's an ODE with an infinite dimensional parameter here. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. So here's an example of the visible region from this trajectory. And so if you know the environment and you ask me, I want the path that maximizes uh, information gain, which is the one that minimizes the volume of the unseen area, you can solve it using uh, an optimal control problem that tries to solve this PDE subject to constraints on seeing the entire space if it's compact, okay? And there's a primal and dual form, they're fairly uh, uh, simple. And if you want to do that in the shortest possible way, you have a standard optimal control problem. Uh, that's uh, an Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And I was saying in the beginning, the problem with this Hamilton-Jacobi equation is that the state, big X, is these two functions. So the state is infinite dimensional. So there is a little bit of literature on infinite dimensional optimal control problem for linear systems. This is not the case here. So essentially, the bottom line is that this is completely intractable. Okay, so it gets even worse because this was assuming that you know the environment, you know all the objects. <coughs> so I know what's behind the wall. I know what's behind the hill. Apparently Lord Wellington said that uh, the value of a good general is to know what's behind the hill, to be able to guess accurately what's behind the hill. So if you don't know what's behind the hill, you have to guess. And so for instance, uh, if I want to minimize the uh, unseen area, here, the unseen area could be the one in white because the object could be a thin shell, or it could be none because the object is solid, or it could be anything in between. So you have to guess a prior. So this is where things get a little bit uh, shaky because you can either guess a prior on the shape of objects because an object could be a thin shell, could be a demi-loon could be solid in the white area or could be anything in between. So you could guess a prior and then do a lot of work to compute the posterior and then try to maximize that. Or you could just guess the posterior, okay, which would be a heuristic, okay, a, a, a control task, uh, a heuristic control goal. And so they're both are equally arbitrary in my view. So we guess the posterior, so we guessed an energy function that we want to minimize. What is important to be able to do is, for this heuristic, it's important to be able to uh, provide bounds that tell you not only that eventually you see everything, the Roomba vacuum cleaner does that, a random walk does that, but uh, that you can see everything in a finite amount of time and be able to give a bound on how long this time is, okay? So here's the one that we used, which says, and uh, takes a little bit of, to motivate, but it basically says that uh, the benefit you get or the, uh, or the value you get uh, is uh, the integral along these frontier lines okay, of the inner product between the position where you are and the normal to this frontier line, so this angle here, which is related to how long it would take for you to break this frontier point, to cross it, okay? weighted by the unseen area, which is the white and gray here. Okay? This is monotonically related to the unseen area, if you knew it, but of course you don't know it. Sorry, yes. Here the domain bounded? Okay. Here the domain is bounded, and we're working on extending this to unbounded domain. There are obvious ways of doing it, but computationally it's tricky. So uh, this is actually not too, despite the fact that it looks ugly, it's not too expensive to compute, and uh, you can have an algorithm that either, the, the nice thing about this is that uh, if you're here and you determine uh, the next best spot, th so there's a literature in Activision on next best view. Uh, if you restrict the next best view to the visible part, the geodesics to get there, the functions that uh, minimize the function are straight lines. Okay, so the control part is trivial. So, but you can decide whether you 
decide what the next spot, what the next goal is, go all the way there with your eyes closed. Once you get there, open your eyes and replan. That seems rather stupid. Or aim at your first goal. As soon as you start moving, new portions of the world become visible, and so you can replan. Okay. So we did some experiments uh, generating random environments uh, and so on. And it was, what was surprising is that in the non-adaptive strategy where you just close your eyes and go to the next goal, obviously you do a lot less computation uh, than in the adaptive case. But if you look at the total distance travel, it's actually not very different, which is, was somewhat surprising to me. Now, this could be a fluke due to the fact that we're working on a very small set of worlds, maybe. But more importantly, for both cases, we have bounds that tell you not only that you will eventually see everything, but tell you that you will see everything in a finite number of steps. And we can bound this number of steps as a function of the complexity of the environment and the uh, residual unseen area. OK. Do I have five more minutes? Yeah. You have a, yeah. OK. So what I told you so far is the following. So first, I have argued that the inference criterion that you use to infer a representation, which is a function of the data, is the minimization of the uncertainty of future data. Then I told you that in order to close the information gap, you also need to exercise control in a way that will give you the most uncertain possible future data. And then I've showed you that for the case of visibility only uncertainty, in the sense that the only reason you cannot detect something is because you don't see it, then you can design uh, surrogate functions of an optimal control problem that are reasonable to compute and that have provable bounds. Okay. Now, of course, in addition to visibility, there are other sources of uncertainty. Okay. And in addition to that, there's also cost associated to getting measurements, which I've not mentioned so far. Okay. So what we are uh, going to next is trying to, number one, characterize uh, the same type of uh, control tasks for the case where you have uncertainty also due to scale. So you know, something could be visible, but just so far away that it projects onto less than a pixel. So as far as you're concerned, it, you don't see it. Okay? And so how do you evaluate that? And also, how do you evaluate the trade-offs? So just a slight aside is, uh, in communication theory, we have ray distortion theory. Ray distortion theory says that your task is to transmit data with the smallest possible error. And your cost is the capacity of the channel. And there is a very nice trade-off that says that you tell me the performance you want, and I tell you how much you, you have to pay. Okay? And providing you're willing to pay enough, you can get whatever you want, which is nice. So many people in the 90s were interested in something similar for vision. They so, say, you know, I need to shoot a rocket. I need to know whether it's a tank or a school bus. How much do I have to pay to know that with a probability of error smaller than 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. Okay, how much do I have to pay to get to that performance? And many people worked on this problem and uh, nothing came out of it. Nothing came out of it because people were thinking of the currency to trade off performance in a visual decision task as the number of bits, the resolution, the computational power, memory, and so on and so forth. If you don't see something because it's occluded, right? You can have all the memory you want, all the pixels you want. You're just guessing, OK? So you're at chance level. So what I'm trying to get to is to the fact that the currency that trades off performance in a visual perception task is not the number of pixels, is not the amount of memory, is not the computational time. It's the amount of authority you have, the control authority you have over the sensing process, OK? It's how much you can control. So how do you measure that? OK. So here comes the Porcini farm, okay? So Porcini mushrooms are sort of like terrorists in the sense that they grow in cluster wherever they want. They don't tell you. Uh, the only difference is that they don't run. Although if you ever hunted for Porcini mushroom, you kind of wonder whether they, in fact, do run. <laughs> um, you cannot farm them. So uh, the scenario is the following. So you are a, you want to farm Porcini. So you just buy a big plot of land. And uh, let's say in the former uh, 
uh, communist bloc. So you, you know, there are these very nice coniferous uh, uh, forests. Uh, Porcini grow very nicely there. But uh, people are becoming expensive there too, so you don't want to just send out uh, people to hunt for them, so you want to put cameras, okay? And you have choices, okay? You can just put stationary cameras, zero dimensional sensors, no control authority whatsoever. You just put cameras there, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, okay? And then what I've shown you before is there's a trade-off by how many cameras you have and the risk which is related to visibility in that case, okay? So the more sensors you have, and so long as you have a sufficient number of sensors, you can cover the whole space. Now, there is one parameter which is the clutter density, okay? So if your forest is very sparse, you don't need many sensors. If your forest is very dense, then you need a huge number of sensors to cover them. And because Porcini take years to grow, uh, you put a camera here, and next year there could be a, a tree right in front of it, so there is a certain amount of uncertainty related to that, okay? So you have the choice of zero dimensional sensors, one dimensional sensors, which are cameras that are mounted on ropes. My colleague uh, Bill Kaiser called these NIMS, uh, what is this? Uh, Network Info Mechanical System. They're a rope with a pulley with a camera that goes back and forth. So it moves on a one dimensional trajectory. So you have one dimensional sensor. You have ground robots that can move on the floor, on the forest floor. So these are two dimensional sensors. At some point, they could be occluded, so they may not be, go, be able to go that way. And then you have three-dimensional sensors, which are UAV that can go anywhere they want, okay? Now, these sensors have different costs. There's an affine function for the cost. There's the installation cost. It's a one-time cost that you incur when you mount these sensors. And then there's an operation cost, which is the amount of energy that you consume. So the control authority has these two components. One is essentially due to the geometry of the state space, so the volume of the reachability space and so on and so forth, something that has to do with the intrinsic dimensionality of the sensor. And then there's operation or energy costs that could be uh, monotonic with time but not necessarily linear, okay? And what you see here is for the case of visibility only uncertainty, okay? So this is single, uh, sorry, multiple sensor of zero dimension, so cameras mounted on the infrastructure. And this tells you the trade-off between risk or performance in your task and number of sensors. This is one sensor only as a function of the number of measurements you take. So if you have a stationary sensor, zero dimensional, if you take one image or a million images, it doesn't do anything to you, okay? So it doesn't improve the risk at all. Because if something is not visible, it's not visible. There's nothing you can do. If you have one-dimensional sensors, you, your risk is lower, but at some point it also asymptotes, and the place it asymptotes depends on the clutter density. Two-dimensional and three-dimensional sensors here are fairly similar, but if the clutter density is very high, your two-dimensional sensor at some point is gonna hit a boundary and cannot go beyond, and so it also asymptotes, okay? So you can get this type of uh, empirical results, and if you also have now uncertainty due to range, then qualitatively you have different results because even a single sensor can benefit from repeated observation, so the risk actually goes down as you gather more and more images. Of course, it also asymptotes in the case of high density environments, okay? So let's go back to your task. So you are setting up this Porcini farm and you have to decide, are you going to go with a million stationary cameras or 100 cameras on wires or 10 ground robots or one UAV, okay? So what you can do empirically, and I wish we were able to do this analytically, unfortunately Shannon solved all the easy problems, the Gaussian channel and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a lot uh, more difficult, but what you can do is empirically you can relate risk to cost, and these cost plots are, so this gives you essentially the loss per unit uh, cost. These are discontinuous because you can have zero dimensional, one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional sensors. So for instance, here you could ask, uh, what is the optimal sensor dimensionality that I could choose for a certain level of costs, given uh, a certain number of measurements that I can afford? So, you know, uh, if I want a very small uh, error, then I have to choose a three-dimensional sensor. If I'm happy with a little more, then I can choose a two-dimensional. Or if I'm willing to make more measurements, I can choose zero-dimensional and so on and so forth. Uh, and here, if uh, for different levels of clutter, uh, 
And, and here's the level of loss that instead trades off the uh, cost with performance. And of course, there is a uh, arbitrary weight between the two that only if you actually have numbers for how much a camera costs you to buy, to install, to operate, you can instantiate. So Ram tells me that there's a minute left, so let me just summarize. So the point I'm trying to make is that often people ask, uh, what type of sensors do I need in order to solve my control problem? But when you have sensing that's subject to occlusion and scaling, the critical question is more, what type of control do I need to do the sensing I, uh, I would like to answer the question, so the decision task or the control task that I need? So I was part of a uh, workshop on mobile manipulation, and people are very interested in vision as a sensor for manipulation. I'm more interested in manipulation as a way to perceive, as Rujina was mentioning. It's not a new idea. It's been around for a while. And Rujina has been one of the pioneers of this. And she was doing this when computers had powers that were one thousandth of what we have now in a cell phone. So I think the time is right to revisit these ideas in a new context where we have powerful computers we can hold in our hands and where we have analytical tools that we didn't have at the time. And so hopefully we can crack some of these problems. Thanks. I think your dilemma is as old as Anaxagoras again. I think this was the debate about, uh, you know, do we sense to control? Yeah. Anaxagoras is the. Water, flow, flow. Flow, yes. So, so, so. Flow as as uh, no, no, uh, is a guy who believed that the mind exists uh, to the, the mind exists to control the limbs. To act, but, right. Uh, whereas uh, Plato believed that uh, the mind exists. Uh, the mind exists to do wonderful things, including moving the body. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, so the control of guys are, the pla are platonic, whereas uh, you are the Anaxagoras of... Uh, uh, Very good, yes. Um, so does anyone have any other questions? Or comments. If yeah. you don't buy what I say, please uh, speak up. I, want, I welcome uh, challenges. Yeah, no, I thought it was a great talk, and I actually bought everything you said. Um, and so, I'm so worried that, about that. But, no, no, <laughs> but with that, with that, so let's assume we can solve the problem of doing inference. We can solve the problem of doing control, right? We can maximize the information. But the one part you didn't talk about is how we find the minimal representation we need to solve a task, right? Right. I, think. I wish I, I w yes, you are right. I didn't talk about that I, in the sense that, uh, so I've only shown formal models. I've not showed you how to instantiate them other than for a very simple case of the control for a flat or, or two or three dimensional cartoon world with only visibility uncertainty. Okay, so this is the very simplest case where we can actually say something about the control. On the inverse part, we can say something more. I just didn't have time to talk about it, but we have instantiations of these models for what's known as the Lambert ambient model, which is a model with constant illumination, Lambert and reflection. And, uh, and so we, we can do things about that that I didn't have time to talk about, but I'll be happy to talk about it afterwards. But in general, these are hard inference problems uh, because the object of inference is essentially infinite dimensional because the uncertainty is in the domain of the function that you want to infer and in the range of the function you want to infer. And so uh, there, there's many complications once you instantiate it. So I think we